getting the perfect me for, for an interview. I'm just settled into my buzz, and now I'm all fantastic. Awesome. <laughs> At the first table, I was still too fucking blazed. <laughs> now we'll talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. All right. So, Kevin. I saw you in the back. I know, right? I didn't want to talk to you too much over there. <laughs> Sounds weird, but we did. We run into each other near the back. <laughs> so, AMC is in the Kevin Smith business with... A little bit. I, I don't know. I look at AMC. Out. AMC is in the Robert Kirkman business and the... And the uh, Chris Hardwick business, mm -hmm. we get a little taste, man. But they do seem to like me. It's fucking amazing that not only did, have they done Comic Book Men for six fucking seasons, um, but now geeking out as as well. We got to do that. I don't know if we get to do it again. They haven't decided whether there'll be a season two. I guess we'll hear in like two months or something. Like that. But oh my god, it was fun while we did it, and, and everyone at AMC really liked the show and was supportive. So yeah, and in terms of people who you know are still interested in Kevin Smith, AMC seems to be there yeah i don't know why to be honest with you. uh I'm, but i love it i'm, I'm i told charlie collier is the guy that right. runs the show over there him and and still joel stillman and charlie collier is the greatest fucking ceo on the planet in terms of most cats are you know once they get a suit on they're, they're, they got to maintain a posture for shareholders and shit like that charlie collier one of the funniest people in the world in email and in person like one of the most personable fucking heads of a company this dude called me, I, I ain't bragging, I just want, like, I, honestly, I just want to praise the man for a second, because without him, I ain't got a fucking show. Called me up, and he goes, hey, man, that jersey that you wear on the show, can you send me one? I said, yeah, you want us to make you one in your size? And he goes, no, can you send me a game-worn jersey, like, that you've worn on the show, I want to hang it up in the office. Oh, cool. That made me roll a fucking tear. That man made me feel like Wayne Gretzky for one second, where I'm like, you want my jersey? So, yeah, they, they do seem to like us over there uh, a, a little bit, thankfully, otherwise... I don't, I'm, I don't, I wouldn't have a place in television, I guess. Right. So do you think that little taste is going to turn into a full course meal with things like mall brats coming up? Oh, that's a good question. I didn't even think to pitch to AMC. How, how weird. <laughs> <That> was, <laughs> I've never thought about that. I don't know. Like, I'm, here's why, here's why I never thought about, about AMC. They, you know, you heard don't shit where you eat. Mm -hmm. I got two shows there. Right. If I went in and pitched mall rats, we're not calling mall rats, we just call it mall rats, no, okay. not mall rats. But like, if I went in and pitched mall rats there, and then they were like, yeah, it's not for us. You know, that's like, when I was in high school, I tried to kiss Janet Peterson at a party, and she's like, oh, Kevin, we're just friends. And that's shit, I carry that around like herpes to this day. Like, oh God, how embarrassing. Like, I thought we were more than that. So I would hate to presume upon our, friendship they've heard me out in the world talking mall rats mall rats and nobody's been like hey bring it here so i think i'm okay. okay but i go pitch that next week as a matter of fact they go to they've lined up showtime netflix nbc and what was the other one? Oh, amazon oh. where buck rubanza is currently sitting so those are the first four places we go pitch if amc winds up on that fucking list i'm gonna credit you because yeah. that was an idea i never thought of but honestly like i think i would stay away from that because i'd It'd be weird if they said no. Right. Like, I'm trying to think, what did I, did I ever pitch them anything? I mean, I've got two things on their network, but they were two things that they kind of put together. Right. Like, it wasn't me going, hey, let's do this. Other people put comic book men together, and I was involved. And geeking out, they kind of picked up with Greg, and then they were like, hey, why don't you have Kevin in it too? Yeah. And that's how I wound up in that show. Did I pitch hit somebody there years ago? I might have pitched them hit somebody. And we didn't do it. And I remember it felt like weird for a little while. For me, not for them, because mm -hmm. they say no to a lot of shit. Yeah. And I can't fault them. They say yes to me on things, too. Mm -hmm. But I would hate to go in there, pitch them something, and then they're like, nah. And then I, you know, they're like, hey, see you at the next event. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm like, hey, guys. So I guess probably I, I might not go there. Wow, you got to see my whole <laughs> fucking journey on that, man. Sorry about that. Where to? Um, watching you keeping out. Yes. Um, you get as excited as fans do about yes. seeing like all the stuff like when you went to DC collectibles you were like crazy slide those it. phones up you're not gonna my voice is so <laughs> low if you want to catch me you're not gonna go ahead sorry How, so after being in the back room with these it doesn't look like as much you know so, so, so how do you keep that kind of because like, to me it's like, here it, well number one weed makes everything exciting you know, so I'm blazed constantly. So I meet cool people. I'm, I, it, you know, it's, everything's dialed up to yeah. 11. I'm like, oh my God, this is fantastic. They take me cool places. Everything is even better, man. Everything's more vivid and stuff. But the enthusiasm, the genuine enthusiasm is still there. Like, you know, I, 
didn't envision all this, and I did not envision the last 22 years, and, and all I envisioned was trying to make that Clerks movie, and that opened up all these fucking doors. Everything else has been house money since. It's all been gravy. Now we're at a place where, like, not only do I have a show with my fucking friends, where I get to watch my friends on TV, now there's a show where I just get to go look at shit that I would pay to go look at otherwise. Meet people that I've always wanted to meet and be able to talk to them, and they talk to me like I'm one of them or something like that. That still feels fucking amazing. And yeah, every once in a while, one of them comes in the door, they're like, oh my God, you're Silent Bob. Like, they remember the shit. But other than that, <laughs> like, that's a whole lifetime ago. And as much as that was, sorry, as much as I got very animated putting my phone, as much as that was fun to build a career and whatnot, building that career allowed me to get to a place where I could just fan out for a living. Dude. You know what I'm saying? Like, I've fanned out for free most of my life. Now I get to do it for a living. They'll pay me to sit there and fucking talk to Charlie Cox on a rooftop. You know, and I take a picture and I put it on Instagram. It's all gravy all over the place. And then people are like, what's Charlie Cox? Like, I'm like, he's amazing. And I eat out on that story for a long time. It's fandom is in me. It's the only reason I wound up as a filmmaker. I just loved movies so much. I always tell people, like, anytime I do q and after a flick or something like that, I'm like, anybody who sits in a movie theater that watches all those credits ain't looking for a Marvel, you know, post thing at the end necessarily. I said, that that's a movie buff, man. That's like a hardcore movie fan. And I've met every filmmaker in the business. Not every, but, you know, over the course of the last 22 years, I've met a lot of fucking directors. Male, female, all different race, creeds, and colors, man. All different levels of talent, like fucking geniuses like Scorsese and, and, and Quentin and then fucking people like me at the bottom of the rung. I've met them all and shit. One thing they all share in common, they're just fucking movie buffs at heart. They are the motherfuckers who sat there and watched a movie all the way through to the credits. They're the people that are a little more interested in the movies than, like, you know, most people are interested in sports or fucking news or politics or whatever. That's their passion. All those people that do it professionally, they just one day got sick of their passion just being their passion. They get to the point where they're like, why them, why not me? Like, they're doing it. Why can't I jump over there and do it? Why not me? And boom, they manifested into that world. So rather than just sitting from the outside and watching, suddenly they get to play. In doing that, it opened up all this weird opportunity for me. The person that I was when I started never fundamentally changed. I love this shit. You know how much, how happy it makes me to not just know, but to be at one of the largest Comic Cons on the planet in New York City. I've been going to New York shows, not cons, shows since I was a fucking kid. The Fred Greenberg shows up at the Penta, well, we became the Penta Band Hotel. Um, I've gone to the church con shows and stuff like that. Going to New York and going to a place where you could buy comic books and hear your, your favorite professional speak or something, I did that. Like, I did all my time doing that on one side of the table. I still love that. That's still in my blood. I never grew out of it and stuff. It's a little more difficult to do now. If I go onto the floor, they're like, it's fucking him. Or someone's cosplaying really good as him and shit. <laughs> so, you know, I could put on a mask and do that stuff. I've seen people do that. But, you know, it's, it's just not the same world. I get lucky every once in a while that you get to a con early, like, we'll take you through the floor before it opens so you get to look at everything, maybe buy some shit and whatnot. But it's not quite the same experience. So just because I don't get to deal with it the same way doesn't mean that you lose your passion for it. Like, just, you know, I live in the back halls of these buildings. Like, that's, they bring you up through an ele elevator, through the back. It's, it's almost like Spinal Tap, trying to find the fucking stage generally and stuff. And then, periodically, I see glimpses of the floor. And when I do, my heart fucking still races. And not in the way of, like, ooh, there's too many people. It's just, like, right there is magic. Like, if I go fucking 20, 25, 30 fucking feet, man, shit, 100 yards, I'm in the heart of fucking magic. I'll never be bored again. I'll always be surrounded by things that will keep my interest or people that are interested in the same things as I am. So it's easy to maintain that, man. It's like dream come true that somebody's like, uh, here, do a show with your friends and talk about things that you love. Like, we don't even do a show about us, you know what I'm saying? Like, given an opportunity to do any show you want and stuff, we didn't really focus it on us. It's all about the, the ephemera. It's all about the comics and the things we grew up on and stuff. It's a nostalgia fest, oddly enough. Six episodes, six seasons into the series, I look at it now and I'm like, oh, it's total nostalgia heroin for fucking people that grew up around the same time we did or people who were kids around the same time we watched these programs and stuff. And I hear from a lot of fathers and mothers who watch it with their kids and I'm like I never in a million years imagined I'd be involved in anything that you could watch with your kid but I understand it about this show like it makes me happy when I see shit and I see it a lot enough to comment on it. not just like oh I've seen it once but in my Twitter stream people go I'm now going back to a comic book store because I watched the show like you showed me something I hadn't seen in a while I didn't realize this thing existed 
it becomes like a commercial for the best times in, of your life if you were ever into this kind of shit. Yeah. And so watching people come back, man, that's, you know, I can't, I guess the greatest gift I can give to my audience is giving their money back, particularly on shit like Tusk. But, I, you know, <laughs> I need that to fucking live. The best thing I could do is, is kind of give them, like, ways to get back to that which is important. Um, when you show, and it sounds stupid, and believe me, I'm not saying, I'm doing the noble work, but with something like comic book men, when you show them, like, um, there's this thing called Big Track. When I was a kid, it was so fucking stupid. It was a programmable toy. It had a keypad on it, and you could make it go left, right, and shit like that. And it had a little dump truck, and then it would dump shit out. You remember, right? Suddenly, it just fucking... You show somebody that, man, who hasn't thought about that in 20, 30 years because they're, you know, they're built a life and they're doing other things and they've got bigger th shit to worry about. But you show them that, man, that's a time tunnel to the best time of their life, man. They'll, that's valuable. Like, that's why I love the movies I love. Like, why I continue to watch Jaws at age 46, even though I've seen it 4,000 fucking times. It's a tunnel back to one of the greatest moments in my life, the first moment I saw fucking Jaws. So when you could show people like the stuff that made up their childhood and showcase it in a way, nobody's ever going to show this shit on TV. Like, I don't know, it's kind of cool for folks. They kind of take a trip with you, a sentimental journey, if you will. And I never imagined that's what the show would be, but it kind of became a nostalgia fest. Like, you know, I was telling the dudes over there, when I was a kid, HBO had this show called Remember When. It's talking about circa 1982, 83, when we first got cable down in, in uh, central Jersey. And it was like, they'd pick a year, and I think Dick Cavett was the host, and they'd be like, 1956. And they'd do like a half an hour on fucking nostalgia about that year. And my old man loved that fucking show and forced me to sit there and watch it with him. And it was like poison for a young man, because I'm like, I can't believe we have cable where we can watch nudity, and we're watching fucking Remember When. <laughs> That's what this show is. This show is just a glossier version of Remember When. It kind of takes you on a journey to stuff that you used to be involved in, you know? And for those that, that aren't, for kids and stuff, it's more visually interesting, I guess, than Remember When, because that was all black and white footage and stuff. But it's also like, we're talking about shit that's more current. Even though it's nostalgia, it's like, all this stuff is finger on the pulse right now. So here's an old issue of Spider-Man. Hey kids, there's a Spider-Man movie in theaters right now. So I don't know, it's become this thing that people can watch multi-generationally if they choose to watch it all. I know about a million people tune in each week, so somebody's watching the fucking show, and they've let us do it for six seasons. But if they tune in, if they're into that sort of thing, it's a sweet little sentimental journey with some kind of salty humor thrown in. And, I, fuck, I forgot what the question was. No, you answered it. Did I? Yeah, thank you.